Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about electric vehicles and in particular this electric vehicle. So this is my 2013 Nissan Leaf S. Um, we have owned this now for about exactly five years. We've driven it about 25,000 miles. We are the third owners of this vehicle. As we mentioned, this is a 2013 vehicle. So it's about a decade old. Um, it's a first generation electric vehicle that we've had for five years. And I wanted to just take a look at it. I've been meaning to make this video for a while to just talk about some of the features, what I like, what I don't like about the vehicle, and really, does it make sense to still have a first-generation electric vehicle this late in the uh, electric car game? So, with that being said, why don't we first, uh, let me jump over to the computer, let's take a look at maybe the window sticker and some other details and specifications about this car before we take a closer look at the actual hardware on the vehicle. All right, so here's an excerpt of the web listing that the dealer had for the car when we saw it. So as you can see, it's a 2013 Nissan Leaf S. Um, they were asking about 9,000. We were able to talk them down to about 8,200 as a kind of sticker price, but of course that's gonna add pricing and uh, fees and all that kind of stuff on top of it. So we'll talk about the actual economics about this later, but just wanted to show that this is the state that we purchased it in. Um, it had a nice clean Carfax. There were actually two previous owners, so we are gonna be the third owner of this car um, and had about 46,000 miles on it. Um, the other thing that might be useful to look at right now is the uh, window sticker for this car. So here's sort of a redacted version of the window sticker for this particular car. And as you can kind of see, when we bought this back in 2018, so I guess it was about a five-year-old car, um, but look at this. Uh, in fact, when it came off the factory, they were asking, you know, 31000 So <laughs> uh, just letting it sit for a couple of years is uh, very helpful for that sticker price bringing it down from 31 down to about um, 8 or 9K. And uh, interestingly, again, we'll talk about the uh, value of the car in terms of depreciation and how it holds its value over the last five years uh, a little bit later in this video. But here's what it looked like at uh, coming off the factory. So you can see it's a Nissan Leaf S. So again, with the Nissan Leafs in this year, I think they had three trim categories. They had the S, the SL, and the uh, SV. Um, the S was kind of the most basic. So you can see it's got a 24 kilowatt hour battery. Um, it has a standard 3.6 kilowatt uh, onboard charger, but um, it, this one actually has the charger package, the optional charger package, which I really do enjoy, which has a higher power onboard charger as well as a DC fast charge. Um, so again, let's just look through some of these features and then we'll go out to the car and see what they actually look like. But these are all pretty darn standard stuff. Um, there's a portable trickle charger cable. That's the 120 volt kind of uh, level one charger that we'll take a look at later that comes with the vehicle. Again, you got pretty much standard stuff, airbags. Um, it does have latch um, attachments in the rear for children. And we'll take a look at that because we're using that in our car. Um, what else is kind of interesting? Uh, it has heated front and rear seats. Uh, it has a heated steering wheel, which is kind of nice. Um, some of these things are a little bit interesting when you read their window sticker. Some things like the, uh, like the radio and the Bluetooth. We're going to take a look at that because that's a little bit deceptive the way it's listed. But um, it does have pretty much your standard accoutrements here. Um, yeah, so what else i guess the only other thing to really call out yeah is this charger package as you can see it's an extra thirteen hundred dollars coming off the factory but i do think this is well worth it because this is going to enable us to do level two charging both at home and away um the quick charge is uh, actually kind of interesting i've only used it once and we'll we'll take a look at that later um it does have floor mats um that's also helpful because we've got uh kids and a dog and things are messy so that's good so anyway, this is sort of the window sticker of the overall vehicle coming off the factory. So with that being said, why don't we go back out to the car and see what all of these uh, accessories look like. All right, so let's maybe just take a quick walk around the car just so you can kind of see what it looks like. It's a pretty standard hatchback configuration. Um, Maybe what I will mention is uh, the roof rack, that is not standard. That's aftermarket, so we added that. But as you can see, it's nice that you can mount that kind of stuff and it fits quite nicely. In fact, you can see I got three bikes up there and uh, we'll take a look at that later. It um, does have a backup camera right there, as well as a rear wiper. Um, otherwise, like I said, pretty darn standard. The other thing to maybe call out is if we come here to the front, um, 
the charging port is right under this little flap. So there's a couple ways you can open that. Um, in fact, maybe now might be a good way to talk about that since we're talking about electric vehicles. Um, the charging is probably very important. So one way you can open that is that with the key fob, there's a button right here that if you push and hold this for a couple of seconds, this will open. Pop, right? And then you can open this up and inside you kind of have your level one and two charger as well as your fast charging port. Um, actually funny, when I bought this second hand, this, was, uh, this is what the DC fast charging port looks like. It was missing, uh, this, this flap must have broken off. You can see it, the, the, the normal one is here for the kind of level one and two charger, but this was missing so I had to 3D print this <laughs> to, to fit. If you're interested in that, I'll leave a link to that part. Uh, okay, but that's the charger. That's how that works. So you nose this guy into your charging spot and you can charge it up pretty easily. Um, while we're also talking about the key fob, maybe I'll, obviously we'll talk about one thing is uh, opening the car. So right, it's locked right now. So obviously you can hit the unlock button to unlock the doors. But one thing that's nice is actually if you just have this key fob in your pocket, so it doesn't even have to be near, you can walk up and right now again, see it's locked. But if you push this little button right here, it will unlock the driver's door. So that's a really nice feature. So you don't actually have to fish your keys out of your pocket to get it open. Um, now notice that the other doors are still locked. But again, if you would come here and push this button two times, it should unlock all of them. In fact, let me, let me close, let, let, me, let me show you that. In fact, let me lock everything up just so you can see this properly. Okay, so locked, driver's door is locked. All the other doors are locked. So you can now come here and push this twice. One, two, and now the driver's door is unlocked as well as the other doors. So that's a nice feature. Um, again, it saves you from having to fish your keys out of your pocket. And uh, I guess while we're talking about locking, let's just make this uh, an exhaustive video to make sure you see all the features. So again, let me lock the car. I'll push the lock on the key fob. So everything is locked. All right, now the rear, the trunk, actually, uh, maybe what I should do is let's take these keys, let's throw them over here kind of far away from the car. Okay, so the keys are over there kind of far away. I don't know if that's far enough, but <laughs> if you come here, normally to open up the rear, there's a little button down here underneath the backup camera. So if you push, and right now nothing, right? because that makes sense, the keys aren't anywhere near. But again, let's go over back here, pick up the key fob. Okay, I'm gonna put the key fob in my pocket. So let's say you're walking out here with a, you know groceries, and again, you don't want to fish your uh, keys out, and you don't wanna walk around to the driver's side to push that not button two times to unlock all the buttons. What you can now do is just come here and now push the button, and look at that. It recognizes that the keys are close to it and will allow you to open up the trunk without having to do any other kind of maneuvering. So again, that's kind of nice. So, all right, I think we're pretty exhaustively looked at <laughs> how to get into the vehicle. Let's go ahead and take a look inside. All right, so let's go ahead and step inside and you can kind of see what it's like. So again, this is the S level trim. So it's basically the most basic. So no leather seats or anything like that. It's pretty much a standard cloth seats and it's not a powered chair. You basically have to kind of manually do all the adjustments. But again, I don't really care. I was mostly interested in getting this vehicle just so we can kind of test out electric vehicles and see how they work. Um, so yeah. Here's what it looks like, pretty darn standard. Um, maybe what we will do is while we're sitting here, we'll also mention, since we were just talking about the key fob, again, all you gotta do is just have the key fob in your pocket, and then you should be able to just push to start the vehicle. So let's go ahead and you put your foot on the brake, and then you just have to push this button. In fact, they even give you, I don't know if you can see that very easily, there's a little diagram there, <laughs> which says, on the brake and then push this and then I'm gonna be quiet because you can actually hear this fun little tone that plays when you start it up. So here we go, three, two, one. Great, so you get a lot of information, namely I've got all the doors open as you can kind of see on that graphic. Um, so that's kind of nice, gives you a little bit of information. Let's close the driver's door just so we can get that to uh, stop beeping. And let's talk about the, the display because there's a lot of information up here. So what you've got over here on 
the left is this is your battery temperature. Okay, so this will tell you how warm or cold the battery is. Um, obviously, that's uh, the emergency brake indication up there. These little bubbles up here along the top are basically saying right now we are not expending nor regenerating any power. So there's a little dot right here in the middle. We'll go driving and what you're going to see is when you accelerate, these bubbles will fill up to show that you're using power to accelerate the vehicle. Conversely, if you take your foot off the accelerator and maybe even step on the brake a little bit, this vehicle has regenerative braking, which is awesome. So you'll see the bubbles actually go here in the negative direction, showing that you're recovering energy during the braking process. So that's a lot of fun. We're going to take a closer look at that later. Um, what else? Okay, over here on this side is a lot of information. So in fact, let me go ahead and um, switch the screen. Instead of just showing what all the status of the doors are, I'm going to come over here and push this button, which is going to allow me to cycle through these screens a little bit and see um, how long it's going to take to charge. And let me go over this and we'll, we'll take a look at that later. But right now, I just want to get to this screen. So right now, the battery is only 35% charged. So with a 35% charge, what you see over here is the car gives you an estimate of how far you're going to be able to go on that charge. So it thinks we've got about 27 miles of range left. And that's what these big bars are here. You can see that it's only about, you know, 35% filled. If the car was 100% charged, these bars would go all the way to the top up here. Okay. So that is giving you the current state of charge of the battery. Now, also these littler bars on the outside, there's two red ones and then a bunch of these white ones up here. This is actually capacity of the battery. So what ends up happening is coming brand new out of the factory, this battery pack should be a, uh, you know brand new, have 100% capacity. So when you charge it all the way up to 100%, you will get the most amount of rain. All of these build up all the way to the top. And what happens is over time, if the battery degrades, you're going to start losing capacity. So these will start dropping. Now, luckily, this car has only dropped one bar. So this bar, it used to be able to go all the way to the top. But over 10 years, it has lost one bar of capacity. And I can't remember exactly how these are graduated. There might be like 12 of these bars. But long story short, when you lose one, you can never get that back unless you replace the battery. And your overall maximum range of your car is going to go down. So you want these as much as possible when you're buying a new one. And again, luckily, I'm thrilled with this car that after 10 years, it's only lost one bar of capacity. So when I charge this entirely up to 100%, I'll get, you know, 75 miles maybe um, of range. Whereas if you had a degraded battery where, you know, four or five of these bars were, were taken off in capacity, when you charge to 100%, you only might get, you know, 50 miles of range or something like that. So again, I'm thrilled about the performance of the battery in, in that sense. So that's pretty much an overall schematic of the diagnostics. Maybe let's flip through these menus just to show you what kind of information you get. Um, so this gives you, yeah, average speed. I never, ever pay any attention to that. Um, yeah, pretty much a standard trip meter. Um, now here, this is where it gets a little interesting. You can add a lot of different things. So for example, if I go down here to this charge percent and I go into this, you can choose to charge the battery up to 100% or only to 80%. So for healthy batteries, you know, we just talked about trying to, to treat your battery nicely so you don't lose capacity. You actually only want to be charging up to 80%. You don't want to go all the way up to 100%. Typically what I will do is I will put this down here to 80%. So that is going to make it so when I plug this in overnight, it will only charge the battery up to 80% of its full capacity, okay? So that's what it gives us. Um, also, there is a charging timer option here. So you could basically set this, if you're in an area where the battery or the electricity prices vary over the day, like sometimes it's cheaper at night when not as much people are using it, you could set that here so that your car will only charge and draw current um, during the cheap hour. So again, I've never ever used this because where I live, it's the exact same price all the time. So. Um, and I always usually charge overnight anyway, so I think I think that's probably fine. So something nice to know. Um, whoops, sorry, uh, I, I hit the wrong button. Let me get back to that page. Okay, here we go. Let's keep looking here. Charging timer, you got other um, information. Oh yeah, the climate control timer. I really have never even used this. I believe you can actually set the vehicle to kind of warm up the car 
um, at a certain time. Like if you always leave in the morning and you want to warm it up while it's still plugged in, you can do that. Um, you can set the clock, you can set maintenance warnings, you know, all units, all this kind of stuff, language. This is not really anything important. So really the only thing I use is this. I flip this all the time between 100%. If I need to know I'm going to go somewhere far, I'll, I'll switch it to 100. But most of the time I sit here and I say charge to 80%. Okay, so let's see what other information is here. Okay, let's go to this page. So the nice thing here is this page will give you an estimate of how long it's gonna take you to charge up your vehicle to the desired charge level. So right here I'm, I'm estimating I'd like to go to 80%. It tells me if I'm on a level two charger, a 240 volts, six kilowatt charger, it's only gonna take me two hours, right? That's the nice thing about having this charging package that we talked about and we saw on the window sticker that I am going to allow myself, this will allow us to charge faster if we're at a charger that has that cap capability. If you were at a level two charger and you didn't have the charging package, it would just take you a little while longer. And really what I'm using almost all the time is this 120 volt option because I'm just plugging into my standard household outlet at home. And this is a nice discussion too because one thing I like about this car is that the battery is not so giant that you, it makes it infeasible to charge at home. This is a totally practical number. I can plug this into the wall of my house here and to go from a 35% charge up to an 80% charge, it's 10 hours, right? So you basically come home at night, you just plug it in overnight and you'll be back up and running in the morning. So really nice feature. I do like that about the car. The battery is not so giant that I do not need to install a level two charger inside my home. I can get away with this level one 120 volt charge, no problem. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, over here you get average fuel economy. So you can reset this whenever. And as you see, when we go driving, you'll see this number change and it'll show you exactly what your fuel economy is in the given moment, depending on how you're driving. So it also averages it for you. So you can see right now, it's about four and a half miles per kilowatt hour. That's how much, um, how efficient it is. So that's kind of a nice feature that I also look at. So yeah, that is pretty much all of the menus that you've got on this in-dash feature. Um, what else is here in the car? You've got pretty much other standard stuff with the radio. Um, the only thing maybe that I will point out with, while we're talking about menus, there's other things you can set on the menu here. Um, it's got a CD player. Um, it has, okay, don't, uh, let's talk about this. This is a lie. <laughs> well, it's a half one. It's, it's Bluetooth compatible. So it is true that you can connect the your phone to the car. But for whatever reason, this is the dumbest thing ever. This is one thing I don't like about the car. Maybe it's because I got the uh, junky trim level. This is the basic model. But what I'm getting at is this Bluetooth, what they mean is you can connect your phone to the car audio for Bluetooth calls only. So you can make phone calls. And in fact, if you come over here to the steering menu, you'll see there's buttons here to allow you to make a call, hang up a call, um, change volume, all that kind of stuff. But it only works for phone calls. You cannot use this for playing music over Bluetooth. So it's completely, I think that was a really dumb move. Um, so this I never ever use. I have not paired my phone directly to the car because 99% of the time I want to use my phone for audiobooks or music or something like that. So you can't believe that this, you, this, this Bluetooth is going to work. This doesn't work. It only works for calls. Maybe if, if you get a better vehicle like an SL or an SV trim, that would work. But for mine, this is calls only. So what I have to do is that is aftermarket item here, this SoundBot. This is going to allow me to connect my phone to this unit. Um, for calls and audio, and then I have to route this into the auxiliary input to the stereo. So most of the time I am running the audio in the car using the auxiliary mode, which is then daisy chained to this, this um, Bluetooth uh, audio and phone call unit. So again, that's a little bit janky, but uh, I guess it, it is what it is. Okay, and while we're talking about the audio, maybe what I will mention is, this is kind of interesting. See, there's a button here for an iPod. So actually, down here, I don't know if you can see it very easily, but there's an actual input right there. And I've got hooked up to an old iPod touch. Again, I uh, can't really see it. I've got it Velcro to the bottom here, but long story short, you could hook an iPod up <laughs> so that you can listen to your iPod 
um, on the radio. And again, I did this initially just to see if it worked and pretty much I have, I never ever use this any longer, but if you want to, you could run an iPod with offline music to the car and that seems to work actually quite well. Now, what doesn't work so great is again, this is a USB, it's kind of USB input for your iPod, but there aren't any USB charging ports um, here and nowadays that's pretty much what you want right is you want to be doing a USB charging for your phone for whatever for you know these extra uh, aftermarket items so uh, you know there is a 12 volt DC plug under there again I, uh, yeah you can kind of see it there so I've had to Frankenstein and get myself this triple USB uh, or 12 volt DC to USB to charge all my phones uh, you know whatever and put that in um, okay, what else? While we're looking at this, uh, oh, we could talk about this. Let's talk about the climate control. So you can do climate control here, but uh, what we should mention is you've got air conditioning and heating, but this is, it's, it's not super duper efficient. Um, meaning if, especially in the winter, if you're in the winter and you're driving around in the cold and you turn on the car heating system, I am shocked at how much this will affect the range. You will see this range number drop by, you know, nine, 10 miles. Um, if you turn on the heating, so using the overall cabin heater for, you know, warming up the car, it's, it's actually very inefficient. So I believe this is just, it doesn't have a heat pump or anything fun like that. It's literally, I believe like a resistive coil that they're running and that's why it draws so much energy. But I was shocked and, and very interested to see that the climate control affects the range of the car so drastically. So that's one thing that maybe isn't so, so great. Um, you know, and a similar story for, for air conditioning. Now, that being said, if you notice down here, um, there is seat heated seats. So the driver has heated seats for either high or low. Same thing with passenger, high or low. And in fact, if you look over here, the rear seats also have high or low controls for, um, for the seats. Uh, and in fact, sorry, the, the rear ones don't have individual. Like they're basically all off or all the whole back row to be honest we've never ever used the back row heating seats because oh, we've got maybe you know kid car seats back there well i really like these and that works quite nicely in fact, there is a steering wheel actually like I said, it's going be well. You turn it on, and this wheel is almost like hot. Like, almost as too hot for a moment. And it doesn't have this heated steering wheel um, option for the winter. Look at what else is over here. Oh, uh, more controls. This is another way that you can open up the front charging port. So if you just push and hold it, I actually use this a lot more than the key fob entry. Now, this, these two are, are very interesting options. There is this thing called a, the, the, the charging lock. I have never ever used this. Um, I did it one time just to see what it did. So what happens is, let's say you're at a public charging station and you plug in your car and you know, you need to get a, a charge, otherwise you're not gonna be able to make it home. One danger is that you plug your car in, right? You start charging, you walk away. Someone can easily come, pull out the charger out of your car and plug it into their car and charge, right? It's kind of a jerk thing to do, but it's, it's feasible. What this does is it actually physically locks the charger to your car. So someone cannot physically yank it out of your car. So if you put it down here in the lock, I believe what that does is it literally grabs it and it locks the charger to your car and it is stuck there until you come back. The auto option, I believe, is it will lock it until your car reaches full charge, then it will release it and let someone else pull it out. So again, I have never ever really used this in a public setting, but I believe that is what it's for. Also over here, this I believe is to allow you to turn the charging timer routine on or off with the click of a button as opposed to scrolling through these menus and hitting this. And again, I have never ever really used that because um, yeah, I've never really, really, never really had to do that. Um, yeah, what else should we look at over here? 
Um, nothing else, you know, pretty much got standard stuff, power windows, you can adjust the angle of the mirrors, both the driver and the passenger side with this knob here, so that's kind of nice. Um, but otherwise, there's nothing too much else I'd like to Maybe what we should mention is we looked a lot at this interior display. Um, also, up top here, there's an, uh, a secondary display kind of in this little nestled area. It might be a little hard to see what's there, but it does give you other information about, you know, like the time and the outside temperature and your speed. And then this little thing over here, when we go driving, you'll see this is a fun little game that you'll see little trees uh, light up here depending on how efficiently you're driving. So it kind of makes a little game of being able to see how efficiently you can drive to see how many trees you can grow um, as you're going through. Um, yeah, what else is interesting to talk about up front? Uh, nothing too much. Uh, you know, I mean, light control here. You've got a little sunglasses bay up top. Um, th these, I believe, are microphones for the garbage phone connection. That, again, I never that's it. The only other thing is you got this little selector here. And uh, what this is going to allow you to do is go into reverse or drive or drive eco. So this car down here in this little diagram has neutral, reverse, and then drive or eco mode. So we'll talk a little bit about drive and eco in a, once we get out on the road, but uh, to show, I think this is pretty much everything to talk about in terms of the driver experience here in the front. Um, yeah, maybe we should get on the road. Um, before we do that, maybe let's hop out of the car and maybe take a look at the other items in different areas. So here's what the rear looks like. So that's a quite surprise. The rear works out. It's quite roomy. Um, as you can see back here, we've got two sets of car seats for one for each kid. And these all have latch anchors down below. So this driver's side rear and the passenger side rear have latch anchors so that you can put the is actually wide enough to still have a normal third adult sit here. I mean, it's it's not super duper comfy, but it's definitely doable. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much here in the rear. Um, now, let's talk at the trunk. So, back, actually way roomier than I, I would thought. So, as you can see, it's pretty darn It's going to, you can see that these seats can actually go down if you need even more space. We've never really done that because again, we usually have car seats back here, so it's really difficult to kind of lay the seats down. But if you need tons and tons of room, you should be able to lay these down and get a ton of space back here. But this rear trunk slash hatchback is actually surprisingly roomy. We've gone to Costco. I put I put a double bob stroller in here, groceries, all kinds of other junk. It all fits really nicely back here. Um, what else to maybe mention? Um, there's there's a couple of nice little here at the side. Back there, but it's got a lot of space. It also comes with this nice little bag that clips into the side. This is where you can keep your charger. So, the factory, this bag is a charger. I don't have a charger in here right now. Obviously, I have the charger and plugged it into the house. So, I can use that to charge my car when I'm at home. But you could use this bag. I use it now for storage, for other things. So, that's pretty much the trunk. Um, again, yeah, it fits an amazing amount of equipment inside. And I'm super duper happy with it. So, that's pretty uh, I don't think there's anything else to really mention. Um, yeah, you know, standard glove box and things like that for the passenger. You've got cup holders there. You've got cup holders at the door. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what the car looks like on the outside. And maybe while we're here, let's just go ahead and take a look under the hoods. You can see it's actually quite clean and spacious. Um, one thing I find fascinating is that, right, this is an electric car. It's got a giant battery bank, but there is still a 12 volt battery here. I imagine for other kind of electrical systems other than the main drivetrain. So again, that is just fascinating to me that there is a separate 12 volt battery here. <laughs> um, 
Now, while we're talking about this, I've seen on some of the higher end trim packages, right? Remember, this is the, the S level, this is the basic model, but some higher end versions have an actual solar panel on the rear of the vehicle to charge that 12 volt battery. So let me come back here and I'll show you on back up here on top on some of the SL or the SVI, I can't remember which ones, but there's an actual little solar panel up here that I believe is used to charge that 12 volt battery, but not charge the main battery. I think that would have been awesome if there was like a solar panel up here that could be used to charge the main battery. Um, that would have been really super cool. Um, oh, actually maybe while we're back here talking about this, I'll show you one thing that I do think is a little bit, um, this is another minor nitpicky thing, but when I shut the trunk, that thing rattles quite a bit. This is a pretty cheesy. You can actually kind of see it kind of moving up and down. So this part right here is not the best, but uh, oh well, what you gonna do? Um, oh, while I'm nitpicking things, maybe what I will also show is um, these headlights are, are they're, they're, they're pretty cool. They look nice, um, but go ahead. Let me shut the, let me shut the, uh, the hood real fast. Um, the headlights look nice, but I know you probably can't see this from the daylight, but if you're sitting here, let me put the camera about eye level here with me. Like this is about my eye level. You can see the corner of the headlight right there and right over there. So at night, when you've got the headlights on, you're driving along, those things actually light up. So it's a little bit annoying. It's a little bit of an odd oversight that that sticks up enough and lights up so that it distracts you as you're driving along. So again, a little bit minor nitpick about this leaf um, that that is visible as you're driving along. All right, so let's head out on the road. So one thing that's interesting is let's put it in reverse and back out of this spot. And actually you can hear you hear that little chiming? So because the car is so quiet, when you put it in a reverse, it actually gives this little chiming to let other people know that you're backing up. Great, and obviously you can still see things on the backup camera, so that's obviously nice. Um, the backup camera is, you know, okay. It's not the most high resolution thing, but I think it gives you uh, enough information of what you need to do. So yeah, let's drive around for a little bit and uh, see how this does. So I really like how this car drives. It's small, it's compact, um, and when you're in normal drive mode, it's surprisingly zippy and peppy. Um, it accelerates very nicely. And the thing I really like about this is it's quiet. Now I've got the windows down because it's a nice summer day, but let's roll the windows up and let's go cruising. And I've got the accelerator down. We're accelerating up to 40 miles an hour. And I'm just gonna be quiet and just listen to how quiet this is. Right, so you don't get any of the, uh, the rattling and the kind of background white noise that you do with an internal combustion engine car. This electric car is just whisper quiet, so I really enjoy that. All right, let me show you one difference between the normal drive and the drive eco mode. So really, all you have to do is as you're going along, right, we're cruising along in drive, if I come down here and flip this over and down one time, we go into what's called, you can see the eco show up. So now we're in eco mode and you saw the range increase estimate went up just a little bit. So to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure this affects your range a ton. What it does affect is the dynamics of driving the vehicle. So normally, like we talked about earlier, when you're in normal drive mode, the car is very peppy and very zippy. If you push the accelerator, you'll go fast. And if you take your foot off the accelerator, the car will coast pretty uh, nicely but now in this eco mode um, you have to press it a lot more in order to get similar acceleration so I think it's really trying to penalize you for making fast accelerations and more importantly what it does is if I take my foot off the accelerator let me do that right now let me take my foot off the accelerator you see how the negative bubble showed up so it starts to try to regen much more aggressively than it does um, in sort of normal drive mode. So what Eco allows you to basically do is you're able to drive around with almost one, one pedal. So I actually don't have to touch the brake a lot 
unless I'm coming up to a stop sign because otherwise what I just have to do is take my foot off the accelerator and the car's regenerative braking kicks in much more aggressively to slow down the vehicle. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's definitely a different feel, right? So the car feels much more sluggish, a little bit harder to drive around, but I think it does help your your range ever so slightly so yes there are some times when you know i'm making a super long trip and i want to be conservative so i stick in an eco mode but otherwise i i really don't use eco most of the time because it's just not as fun to drive i use normal drive mode and what is kind of fun though is that you can switch between the two on the fly so again we're in eco mode we're driving i can just come down here and flip and now we're back into normal drive mode and the car feels back to normal. So that is kind of, uh, kind of nice. Um, maybe while we're talking about, let me show you one other thing. Let me pull into this parking lot here and let's go ahead and put the car. Let me stop here just to show you. Let's put the car in eco mode. Okay. So the car's in eco mode and now let's go ahead and I don't know, let's just, let's pull over here and turn the car off. So I'll show you one thing that I do like about this. It's nice that if we go ahead, push the e-brake down, press this button to put us in park, right? We're in eco mode in park. Now, if I turn the car off, let's turn the car off. And now let's pretend we left and we come back. This is the next morning and you start the car up again. Car starts up and it remembers what mode you were in. So it remembers if you prefer to be in eco or normal drive mode, that will stay um, active. So again, if I just go ahead, let's go into normal or let's go into drive. So now we're in drive eco. And now if I hit this one more time, we'll go into back to normal drive. So now we're in normal drive mode. Again, let's do a really simple example of just, uh, yep, drive for a little bit. Pretend I made a whole day's trip. Okay, let's go ahead and stop. Put the e-brake on, put the car in park. We are in normal drive mode, right? There's no eco, let's turn the car off and go to sleep, come back in the morning and start the car up again. And you'll see it remembers that, no, I don't, I wasn't in eco mode when I shut off. So we're going to come back up in normal drive mode. So that's, that's kind of nice. Um, Okay, oh, uh, i tell you what, let, let me show you one other thing. Let me, let me pull over here and maybe do where it's a little bit more shady and you can see a little bit more easily. Um, okay, here, okay. I, that being said, now this, this remembering what mode you're in is nice, but I do wanna show you one thing that I'm not super thrilled about. Um, put the brake in, let's put it in park, okay. Now, let's go and shut the car off, okay. Um, a lot of times you'll be in, in a rush, right? <laughs> you want to come in here, you want to get going as fast as possible. So you want to maybe hop in the car and just hit, you know, slam it into drive and get going. You actually have to wait a few seconds for this thing to boot up and for everything to be coming online before you attempt to shift into drive. If you don't, if you go too fast, it will go into neutral and it's, it's a little bit silly. This is a really nitpicky, but you do have to wait for it to boot up. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to go ahead and start up the car and try to get into drive mode as soon as possible. So I'm going to start the car, release the e-brake, slam this guy into drive really quick. And you'll see if I do this too fast, it's not going to work. So let me put my foot on the brake to get ready to start. So here we go. Here's the sequence. We're going to hit start, e-brake off into drive, right? So here we go. So let me get my other foot on the e-brake, right? This is like you're, you're coming in, you're just ready to go. So here we go. So start e-brake drive. And I did that. And now when it boots up, uh, look at that. It's in neutral, right? So for whatever reason, it listened to my the, to the fact that I tried to get out of park, but it didn't put it in drive. It's in neutral, right? So I have to come back over here and do this again right? And now I'm ready to go into drive and the same story for reverse. So again, super nitpicky, long story short, you got to wait a few seconds for whatever UI to boot up before you're actually able to select drive or reverse. So <laughs> over the course of your, of the lifetime of owning the car, if you're starting this up hundreds of times, you might waste a fair non-trivial amount of your life sitting here waiting for that silly tone to play and for everything to, to get going. But again, very, very minor issue. All right, so let me show you something about the uh, the power. So 
you know, these power buttons, uh, as you can see, as they go up in the positive range, that, that means we're expending energy from the battery to accelerate. So let me see, let me accelerate here. You can see these things go, go up, right? Um, but now, actually check this out, we're going down a hill, so I'm going to go ahead and take my foot off the accelerator, maybe put my foot on the brake ever so slightly, and now can you see, maybe, let's see, there it goes, right, starting to go into the negative range, right, so we're actually regenerating power now from the braking system into the battery, and actually sometimes you'll see the battery charge level go up. And I think that's just so cool. So right now, what are we at? We're at 25% battery. So let me go ahead, I'll step on the brake a little bit. Now you can see we got two bubbles of regenerating. Look at that, they went up 26%. So we're, we're recharging the battery right now as we are going down this hill. So this is just so cool that you can actually regenerate energy um, based on trading the, connect, uh, the potential energy of the vehicle as we go down. So the regenerative braking system, look at that I'm gonna step on this a little bit more to keep my speed reasonable and look at this now we're regenerating a ton of energy well maybe a ton is a relative term but uh, it's just so awesome I feel like I, I get a kick every time I go down a hill and I can see the charge of the battery going up because we're regenerating energy um, that also brings us up to this little diagram up here. This is like this funny little game. You can see it's starting to grow a little tree. <laughs> so you can grow trees on this. Then you, you grow more trees, but depending on how efficient you're driving. So if you're you're better about regenerative braking, you'll get more trees. And again, it's just a little bit of a game. I actually I have stopped paying attention to that, but I definitely pay attention to the power bubbles and how um, that goes with charging the battery and discharging the battery so in fact oh gosh look at this we got a big hill right here so you're gonna see that the power is gonna go through the roof to climb this hill so look at this look at all the positive bubbles we're gonna need to climb so yep uh oh so now yep we're climbing we're climbing now you're gonna see this battery go down it's probably gonna go down from 26 to 25 pretty soon and but again we're, we're trading off that energy right we regen a lot of the energy coming down the hill now we're gonna spend that energy coming back up the hill now we're back to 25 Great. So again, hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of how the LEAF deals with kind of power management. I really like it because it gives you a little bit more situational awareness of what's going on and how you're using your power as you're driving. All right, so we're cruising along here and maybe since we're cruising, let's talk about one other kind of thing that uh, is maybe lacking on this car. I don't know if it's a, because it's just the S and not the SL or the SV, the higher trim packages, but this car, does not have a cruise control. <laughs> so uh, you're pretty much driving it manually all the time. Now, that being said, you know, you typically you're using cruise control on the highway. And that's maybe another thing we should mention is that this car is really, uh, it exceeds at city driving. If you're driving along, oh, and actually here, check it out, another Nissan Leaf crossing out. So that's the same kind of car. It's very popular, I suppose, here in, in my community. But again, getting back to the community, uh, the highway driving, if you're driving at higher speeds, like above 50 miles an hour um, you're gonna see this range estimate go down so this range estimate is not always accurate and I don't know if they have some kind of averaging algorithm but it will basically look at kind of what you've been doing in the past um, and give you an estimate based on your current driving habits over the last you know mile or so um, so if you're on highway and you're going at faster speeds, this car is not going to get you the same kind of distance and range that you would if you took a, a shorter back road. I know that sounds somewhat uh, counterintuitive, but if you think about it, right, drag, what drag goes up, aerodynamic drag goes up with the square of the velocity. So I guess I'm not surprised that at higher speeds, this car has a harder time and needs to expend more energy to kind of get that, um, that velocity. So again, this really is a car that's designed for back roads, driving it's a good city car but if you're doing significant miles on the freeway um, it's uh, it, it's gonna hurt your range um, so I guess I'm not super broken up in the fact that this doesn't have a cruise control because again 90% of the time probably 95% of the time I'm not on the freeway I'm sitting here on these kind of country back roads just driving around all right, let me show you one of the reasons I absolutely love having an electric car like that. So we're out here at the park, right? Maybe the kids want to go out and play for a little bit. And look at this, a lot of places, in fact, there's a free public 
charger here at my local park. So uh, true, the infrastructure for charging maybe needs a little bit improvement around the entire country, but where I'm at, this is actually quite nice. They've got these free stations uh, sprinkled throughout the community. So if I'm out here um, and I'm doing something like playing at the park or doing something like that, we can just come here and let's just go ahead and again, open up the charging port, okay? And then all you need to do is let's come over here, grab the charger, the free public charger, plug in. That's literally it. You hear it beeping and we're charging. So they're basically paying me to play here at the park. I'm getting free energy. Well, free to me at least, but um, I'm able to charge the car while we're at the park. Um, so that's great. And maybe while we're sitting here, maybe let's talk about the charging a little bit. I don't know if we're gonna be able to see this with the glare of the sun, but um, at night, this is very dramatic. It's very easy to see. Um, let me see if this is visible. Do you see these little three LEDs that are on the front of the windshield? Um, they are blinking and they are telling you effectively the state of charge of the car. So you can qu very quickly, let me see if I can show this with my hand a little bit. You can see the LEDs a little bit better. There you go, hopefully that helps, right? So you can see right now that it's about, you know, somewhere between one third and two thirds full. So at a very quick glance, you can look out and you can see what's the status of charge of the battery of the car. And this is also helpful, especially in places like this, where we're at a public location. You know, we talked about earlier how this thing has the silly ability to lock the charger to the car so no one else can use it. And again, I just don't like doing that from, just from a matter of principle. I don't like hogging things if I don't have to. So someone can very quickly, easily look at the state of charge of the battery there. And if they see nothing is flashing, they can probably infer that, oh, this car here is not using the charger so they can unplug it and plug their car in. So again, this is another very helpful, very nice bit of UI that allows not just the owner but also allows other users to see if this car is actually drawing a current right now at this charging station. So again, this is just so awesome. We're able to basically get energy wherever they provide this kind of service. So plug-in cars, yeah, I, I, I can't get over how great this is. Okay, and while we're sitting here charging for free, <laughs> maybe let's talk a little bit about charging. So this car has two ways to charge. So we've got, this is sort of our standard charge versus a DC, what they call a DC fast charge. That's what this other outlet is for. So this one over here, the standard, if I'm sitting at home, right, we saw earlier that that would take me, I don't know, overnight, you know, to go from a depleted battery all the way up to 100% battery. I've seen things um, as long as, you know, 18 hours of charge. You know, usually I don't go from zero to 100. Maybe I'll go from 30 to 80%. So maybe adding 50% charge to the battery, that might take, you know, 12, 14 hours, something like that at home. Out here where I have a level two charger, right? That's what this one is. This will go significantly faster. So I don't know, maybe five hours to get 50% uh, of the battery, um, something like that, four or five hours. Um, now, if you want to use this guy, the DC fast charging, this one, you can get in like 30 minutes, you can get, yeah, 80% charge. So it's ridiculously fast. That being said, if I understand it correctly, you don't want to be doing this very often because if you use this regularly, that can degrade your battery. Now, the other thing we should mention is this is a, in theory, a nice idea. You know how many times I have actually used the fast charger? I've used it one time. One time in five years of ownership, the only time I ever, ever used this DC fast charger is when I bought the car. It was located, you know, a fair bit away from my home. So I had to find a DC fast charging station on the trip from the dealer back to my house because I couldn't make it in one charge and I didn't want to sit there for 10 hours while I waited for the car to recharge. So I found one DC fast charging station. It worked like a dream. Yeah, we sat there for 20 minutes and it gave us enough of a charge to basically uh, replenish the battery enough to get all the way home. And after that, I have never, ever, ever used this DC fast charge again. I 100% use this sort of standard configuration with an either a level one or a level two charger. So just something to think about that this DC fast charge is maybe a nice idea, but at least for my lifestyle, I do not need it at all. 
and while we're talking about charging, let me mention one more small item. So as I mentioned earlier, what comes with the car is you get one of these chargers, right? It says level one charger and it's great because you can now use this at home and that's exactly what we did was we installed this level one charger in our home. I basically um, screwed it into the wall so it was a permanent attachment and whenever we come home in the garage, I can just plug in the vehicle. Now, the only issue with that is because the range of this car is a little bit limited, um, I wanted it to be a little bit safe and actually had to go buy a second charger that I could just keep in the trunk in case I ever run into any issues. So you can see here, you can find these chargers secondhand online. For example, here on eBay, this is $300. I actually only had to pay about $125 for the charger that I found on Craigslist off just some local person that wanted to get rid of their charger. But again, it's something to think about. Um, I haven't had to use it too often, but I definitely have used it, you know, a handful of times when, you know, we're at a, a friend's house and we're a little bit farther away and it's just nice to be able to break this out of your trunk, plug it into the wall and charge up your car. So that is one additional charge, uh, you know, pardon the pun, that is not necessarily um, explicit in the car purchase price, right? Because you only get one of these chargers. So if you want a second charger for some of these backup cases, you're going to have to probably purchase a second one. And that's just a final note on these chargers. Um, you know, we mentioned this and touched upon it a little bit earlier, but this is a level one charger. And the nice thing about this Nissan Leaf first generation, right, is that um, although the range is small, it's the range is small because the battery capacity is small, right? It's only 24 kilowatt hours. So using this simple level one charger is actually totally sufficient. You can charge this up at home overnight. Now, if you had a larger battery capacity car like a Tesla or something like that, which might have, you know, a 70 to 80 kilowatt hour, so like three times larger, you probably can't get away with a simple level one charger anymore. You would have to probably upgrade to a level two charger to uh, increase the amount of power that you can put into the car. So uh, again, something to think about that the range is a, it's a little bit of a double edged sword, right? The small range is is bad because you can't go far, but it's nice because it has a small battery that's easy to charge with pretty much standard uh, equipment. All right, and now let's talk a little bit about some of the actual statistics and numbers that I've collected over the past five years. So as we discussed earlier, we purchased this car pretty much exactly to the date five years ago, and uh, we've driven it for about 25,000 miles. Now, we were just talking a lot about charging, so let's talk about uh, some of the data that I've collected on the charging. So here is a uh, graph of the... Uh, energy efficiency of the vehicle versus time and I know you've probably seen this or heard about it if you've done any research right but electric vehicles like this they are affected by the weather and you can clearly see this in this data there are seasonal trends where in the winter when it's cold the efficiency drops down I mean it can come down here to you know the 3.4 miles per kilowatt hour Whereas in the summer when the battery is nice and warm, you can get, you know, maybe 4.6 uh, um, miles per kilowatt hour. So a fairly significant change due to the season, right? So it's uh, it's something to think about, right? I, I, I thought this was interesting data, but at the end of the day, let's just call this an average of around, you know, it seems to be you get about a little over 4 miles per kilowatt hour. So if you work all that out, where I'm living, I actually end up paying about 11 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity, right? So if you do this math, you see it's about three cents in electricity to travel one mile with this vehicle, okay? So what's great about that is if you think about this, we can compare this now with our internal combustion engine cars. So we have uh, this, it's, a, it's an older Volvo um, XC70 cross country, right? And also we have similar data that I collected on fuel economy. And you know, given our driving habits, we get around 19 miles per gallon in this car. Okay, so if you do a little bit of math about how far can you go with a gallon and how much does a gallon of gas cost, if I assume a gallon of gas costs around $5 per gallon, this internal combustion engine car works out to about 26 miles to travel one, ga uh, one mile. So what's awesome is if you look at these comparisons, we're talking about an order of magnitude increase and improvement by using the electric vehicle versus the gas vehicle. And that's just on the economy, right? That's in the finances. That's not even saying anything about the uh, the benefits of um, em uh, lower emissions and all of that good stuff. Now, 
the other thing I thought that might be interesting here while we're talking about ga uh, gas prices, I know you might be saying that five gallons, five dollars a gallon is expensive and that's maybe unrealistic, but I was actually poking around and on CNN and this article came up the other day and it said that, you know, guess what? California is not the most expensive state for gas. It's actually Washington, which uh, wh which is where I live, right? And it says, it's yeah, it's about $5 a gallon right now. And, you know, given trends, I would not be surprised if this continues to increase. So I'm hoping that um, it, that, that you know, this, this benefit with the electric car becomes even greater. Um, in the future, and again, the other thing I think that is that is fascinating to, to see is, you know, we I also collect data on how much do we drive each of our cars. So this internal combustion engine car, this Volvo over here, you can see before we were we purchased the electric car, we were driving this car about 20 miles per day, right? And then after we bought the electric car, we pretty much never drive this anymore. Look, it's down to an average of you know one to four miles per day. Um, of driving. So we also cut down our driving with the internal combustion engine car by, again, another nice order of magnitude, right? So if you work out all these numbers, I think what this comes out to is we save, in terms of fuel, over these 25,000 miles, we've saved almost, you know, $5,700 in fuel. And also, this is about 1,200 gallons of gasoline that we haven't burned and put into the atmosphere. So again, I feel good about that. Um, now, that's not the whole story, I guess, because again, if you, if you if we're talking about just how much does the electric vehicle save you versus how much does it cost, again, remember that we paid the asking price that we negotiated it down to was about $8,200. So it came down to a little bit south of 10K after taxes title and all of that kind of jazz. So you can see that we haven't quite saved or, or the car hasn't necessarily paid for itself just on fuel savings, but what's interesting is when we purchased it, there was also some tax credits as well. So actually, if we take that into account, we are pretty darn close to the car having paid for itself after five years. Now, again, in the interest of full disclosure, maybe what we should mention is let me pull up some um, data that we've collected for other kind of ex expenses associated with each of our cars. So the electric car is over here and our gas car is over here on the right. So what's interesting is in Washington at least where I live the tabs of these two cars are not the same, right? They're, they're similar sizes, similar usages, but they're charged very differently. So for the gas car tabs are a little bit over hundred dollars per year. But look at this electric car it's over $300. So there is a $200 a year addition for the electric car, which I'm sure has something to do with the fact that we're not paying gas taxes and all that kind of stuff on the electric car. So again, you got to kind of be a little bit careful. There are, there are pluses and minus from the finance perspective of the electric car, but overall I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled about the finances of the electric car and um, also the ecology and how it's kind of helping hopefully the environment um, from that perspective as well. You know, last thing, maybe while we are talking about car values and, and some of these numbers, remember here that we said we paid about $8,200, that was the asking price of the car, and that was five years ago. Now, for giggles, I actually went around and was just searching for you know, right now, uh, if you wanted to go out and buy this same car, same year, similar mileage, look at this. This is a little nuts. This is effectively the car, tiny bit little lower mileage. I'll bet you the battery on this car is not as good as the battery on the car I've got right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if this number is a little bit higher in terms of what I would have to pay to buy this car now. And again, this is hilarious. Look at this. $8,200 uh, five years ago, and it's basically the same price now. So I'm thinking theoretically you could turn around and sell this car for about what you paid for, which again is awesome um, in terms of how it's retained its value. And if you look at this, it's not a fluke, right? Actually, here, look at this one. This, needs, oh, this is a higher trim package, but you get the idea, right? That basically um, the value of the car surprisingly has not depreciated. And I think that also has something to do with the fact that electric cars are very um, in demand right now. I think everyone is trying to um, you know, make a contribution to the environment. So that is another thing to think about is, uh, you know, not only has the car paid for itself in fuel savings and tax credits, but I think we could probably sell it and now make money if we really wanted to upgrade or something like that. So again, 
from a from a financial perspective and an ecological perspective this electric car has been working out great all right so there you have it so a first generation electric vehicle it's almost 10 years old but it's uh you know what do they say it's an oldie but it's a goodie it's a great car we absolutely love having it for especially around the town trips um we drive this probably 90 percent of the time this is our vehicle of choice when we're doing pretty much anything especially for shorter or even medium range trips i mean we will go to costco in the next town over stock up throw everything in take the dog take the kids you maybe even take a couple of bikes to have some fun while we're at it it's an absolutely awesome surprisingly versatile family car for that type of activity now that being said um, as you saw it's it's not without its flaws right that it's that limited range really is uh, a bit of a handicap right so this is not something that you're going to be able to replace your internal combustion engine car with um, in fact, you know, we have uh, a standard uh, internal combustion engine car that we use for longer trips or if we need to be away for a long time, then we might not be near a charging station. So unfortunately, it, it can't replace it. But maybe what we should say is it can't replace it yet. And that, I think, is one of the problems with the, maybe this first generation electric vehicle is that it's a good supplement to your fleet. It's not going to replace some of your, your other longer range cars, um, especially if you have that type of lifestyle where you need to be able to make these longer trips. So again, um, we couldn't be happier with it. It fits what we need to do, and it has helped us, like we said, drive 25,000 miles on an electric vehicle and save about, uh, you know, 1,200 gallons of gas and emissions, so I uh, could not be happier with it. Okay, so um, with that being said, uh, I think this is probably a great spot to leave it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. If you scroll a little ways down and click on that subscribe button, it really does help me continue making these videos. And the new videos come out every Monday, so I hope I'll be able to catch you at a future discussion and we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'll sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.